everyone. What's chronic disorganization? What's hoarding? What's collecting? How do you know the difference between all of those and when you've crossed the line and it might be too much? We're going to learn about that and much, much more from our expert guest tonight. First, I'd like to thank our sponsor for this show, Emily Parks of Organize for Success. I've known Emily since I was an organizer. She is the technology organizer. When I needed a gift for my fiance this Christmas, I'm like, Emily, help me out. And she said, is he Mac? Is he PC? And she gave me all these wonderful ideas. Emily can help you out in a couple ways. She does one-on-one consulting. For instance, if you're a busy executive that has 4,000 emails and you're just treading water to survive and you need to come up with a plan on how to handle that email so you can look at the big picture, Emily can come in assess what's going on, and then she sits down with you and takes you step-by-step how to take care of things. She also works with groups. Say you're part of a creative group for a magazine. She would work with your department, get everything in flowing in the actual physical space, the shared space, as well as coming up and designating what tasks that people needed to do. And she also offers speaking presentations and workshops. If you're in the Raleigh-Durham Triangle, Ari, you've got to check her out because she has some great classes on Evernote. She knows more on Evernote than anyone I've ever met, as well as taming your technology. If you look here right below the chat room, that will take you to Emily's site, which is organizedforsuccess.biz, and that's spelled out, organizedforsuccess.biz, and you can find out all about Emily's services in more detail, as well as her classes. And I just have to say... I've known Emily since I started my business. She always has a smile on her face. She is so passionate about technology. Every time I see her, she's talking about the latest gadgets, how they can help. She's really wonderful to work with. So it's always a joy to work with someone who's happy and passionate about what they do. So again, thank you to Emily Parks from Organize for Success. All right, I'm going to tell you about tonight's guest. Gerilyn Thomas is a certified professional organizer, chronic disorganization, and a level five master trainer But her true superpowers are her warmth and humor, which are useful when working with clients and coaching new organizers. Gerilyn enjoys sharing the marvels of organizing on Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest, as well as on her blog, Managing Modern Life. A Tar Heel fan and graduate from UNC Chapel Hill, Gerilyn makes her home in Cary, North Carolina. She's a past president of the North Carolina chapter of NAPO, And if she looks vaguely familiar, perhaps you know her from her A&E TV's Emmy-nominated show, Hoarders. Now, Gerilyn did not include this on her bio, but I'm a sleuth and found this out. She is one of 24 professional organizers worldwide, think about that, 24 in the world, to achieve the designation Master Trainer from the Institute for Challenging Disorganization. Welcome, Gerilyn. Thank you, Julie. We are in Gerilyn's in the studio tonight. We're going to have some fun. Now, I have to give a shout out to Gerilyn because when I first started my professional organizing business, she served as a great resource. So if you're looking for someone, and you know, it's true in the bio about warmth and humor. Gerilyn's kind of like the Thomas, Tom Hanks of professional organizing. Aww. You never hear anything bad about her. I, I posted about this show on Facebook. And saw someone and reposted, and they're like, yeah, Gerilyn's awesome. So if you're looking for help, check her out. But we've got a lot of stuff to get started on and talk about. Yeah. So collecting, hoarding, chronic disorganization, where do we start? How do you define it? Let's get started with that. Okay. So one of the most common things people always want to know is, like, they expect me to be able to diagnose them. Am I a hoarder or am I a collector? So the very first thing is, I am not qualified to diagnose anybody, let alone your problems with hoarding and collecting. So um, you have to see a qualified medical mental health professional um, to get a proper diagnosis. And the other thing is, professional organizers cannot treat people. So um, we aren't necessarily as concerned about the symptoms nor the diagnosis. Instead, we like to take care of, you know, what's going on there. So um, a couple things about hoarding. Um, Just because you have, you know, stacked up dishes in the sink for a few days or you've got way too many salt and pepper shakers or anything like that, that does not necessarily make you a hoarder, okay? The thing that sets somebody with a hoarding disorder, which is actually the more polite way to phrase it, the politically correct way to say that is someone with a hoarding disorder. You wouldn't refer to somebody with an eating disorder as the bulimic or the the anorexic. So we try to be a little bit more respectful once we know better. But um, 
They have a hard time discarding anything, whether it's valuable or of little or no value at all. So um, that's the first thing. The other thing that typically I look for when I'm walking around somebody's home or apartment or office is that um, they have so much stuff in their rooms that it precludes the use of what the room should be used for. So in other words, um, there's so much clutter on the bed that the person is not sleeping in the bed. There's so much stuff in the bathroom that the tub or toilet or sinks might not be functioning. There's so much stuff in the kitchen that the person actually isn't cooking in there. So that's that's another thing that sets it apart. And then um, it usually is an isolating disorder and people tend to start slowly withdrawing and not letting people into their home. So that's, um, in a nutshell, I mean, that's a really oversimplified version of what a hoarding disorder is. But I actually worked with someone once and referred her to you because what oh. I thought was very interesting, she had gone to, it might have been the, and I know they changed the name, it's the Institute for Chronic Disorganization, uh-huh. that they had gone to their site and they said, well, if you have 14 inches or less, you're not a hoarder of clutter in the hallway but if you're at 15 then you're a hoarder and they had 14 inches and I was like you know what and I'm, I'm very clear I don't work with hoarders and I said I actually referred you and so what would you say to someone like that I mean again would encourage them right and the other thing that I know there might be someone out there who's not a hoarder but a loved one of a hoarder or a friend that yeah. wants to get them help so right what what would you say to that so um you know Everything, you know, these rules are so rigid and um, stuck in place, and people get really hung up on, like, you know, a quarter of an inch difference, what what is going to make it or break it. But, um, again, I'm not always so worried about that, Julie. That's I want to know why the person wants help, why they're reaching out, um, what about their life is most unpleasant and how do they want me to help them? That's one of the other things. I will not go work with somebody unless they want help. Now, fans of the show know that um, the therapists and the organizers are working with family members and friends who don't necessarily want help, but it's usually in a crisis situation, meaning the landlord is coming in to evict somebody, the children are going to be taken away by DSS, something like that. So I, I'm not such a huge rules follower. And again, that's really the domain of the um, social worker and mental health professional. Now we've got a comment here from Dr. Bill, and we've got a comment from Cindy. And I'll, uh, she said he said he, this hoarder show concerns him. He said he had a patient on the show, and after the show, they got worse. And Cindy said I was a hoarder and organizer. Help me, and I feel so much better. So first, Cindy, congratulations. You know, Absolutely. If you, right. if you were a hoarder and have come back from that and, and gotten your life um, in order, congratulations. That's really wonderful. Okay. And to Dr. Bill's comment, um, I can't speak. I don't know exactly, you know, which person he's dealing with. But um, there, there have been, um, you know, I think the show is not for everyone, and I think you can't predict what's going to happen and you know I'm apologizing on behalf of whatever happened I don't know the situation but um, yeah anytime you disrupt somebody's life um, it could be you know they could have post-traumatic stress disorder there could be all sorts of things going on so I can't I can't speak directly to that but I'll apologize uh, just in case how's that well well, I look at someone like Lindsay Lohan who you know the state I left California is it any wonder why I mean in in all honesty here's someone who obviously has drug and alcohol problems and severe issues and has been to rehab and can't get help and I mean until they probably she several times has relapsed so I would think that that's kind of the same thing well the Um, recidivism rate is high there currently aren't any medications known to really like put a quick fix on a, a person with the hoarding disorder cognitive behavioral therapy does seem to work well but it's a long process so um you know there's no quick fix right might we have a comment from Mike who says the show didn't cause her to get worse So let's talk a little bit about uh, these three factors for when this was, I believe, on your blog for collecting. Perceiving value, maintaining functionality, expressing pride and joy. And that kind of your your little cheat sheet if it's gone too far and with collecting. So talk about that. Okay, so um, going back to the difference between somebody with a hoarding disorder and a collector. So 
one of the things is a collector is almost always really proud of whatever they're collecting. And we know people with, like, cuckoo collections, right? You know, come see my bottle cap collection, come see this and that. I mean, unless you understand what they're collecting, sometimes it's kind of comical. I have collectors in my family, so, you know, I'm talking about them, and they know it. (laughs) But, um... Collectors are proud. They want to have you in. They want to show off their stuff. Usually, not always, but usually if you offer a collector hard, cold cash and it's more than what they paid, they will up trade in a minute. So they'll take the cash in order to go get something bigger and better, right? right? You will not ever see that with a person with a hoarding disorder. And we have even tried on the show. We've brought in appraisal Mm -hmm. experts, antique dealers, and they have offered them what the antique is worth or what the thing is worth and then a little bit above um and it's just it they don't want to let go now i want to remind everyone if you have a question for gerilyn chat it i'm happy to ask or you can call 919-518-973 or skype computers 2k voice so talk about the science you talked about isolation Mm -hmm. um i lost my train of thought here then how does so if i want to do a brief overview. So we've talked about hoarding, we've talked about collecting. How does chronic disorganization play into all that? Well, um, a lot of times the population that I tend to work with most are chronically disorganized people. And a lot of times those people have disorders that sort of piggyback off one another. So sometimes somebody who has been um, chronically disorganized may also have depression or they may have another coexisting disorder, um, an eating disorder. They may have several disorders. And oftentimes, um, they are unable to function for long periods of time. Or they function well outside the house, but the minute they come in, like they hold it together just enough to, to go to their job and barely get what they need done, done. And um, their inside falls apart, the inside of their house. So. When you're working with chronic disorganized, disorganized clients, then, for instance, they might also be working with a therapist because if they have two oh, yes. um, things going on, that you kind of are both tackling one issue at a time. Right. If that client... I, so if someone has a hoarding disorder, I will not work with them unless they agree to work with a therapist because I've said it before, I cannot really help somebody with a hoarding disorder. It, it has to be a collaborative process. Um, With someone chronically disorganized, oftentimes the organizer is the first person to be invited into the house or to kind of hear about their problems. And again, um, most of us do not ever try to play therapist. We strongly suggest that they go seek help for somebody that is qualified to help them. Oftentimes it's therapy or medication or a combination. Now, if the client agrees to let the therapist and the organizer talk and signs Mm -hmm. off on that, that's really the best situation because then the organizer can share what's going on in the home with the therapist. The therapist does not share with the organizer what's going on in their sessions. I appreciate you clarifying that for me because, you know, one thing I always have, um, I want people to take action, to do something. I always have a get off the couch segment, which, you know, here you're about to do at the beginning. I'm just so excited to have Gerilyn in the... (laughs) in the house but your get off the couch is we've got sound effects i'm waiting for the sound effects get off the couch is to get rid of clutter this week (laughs) whether it is mental clutter such as anxiety or stress because that's not doing any good emotional clutter who drains you who is a taker and doesn't give you anything it's time to get rid of those people and also the physical clutter that we're talking about here with gerilyn whether it's your beauty products your kitchen, your cell phone, all of that. I want you to take something this week and get rid of clutter. But I do this show because I know people are amazing and they have all these gifts to share. Mm -hmm. But it's important to distinguish that because I always thought, well, is chronic disorganization a crutch? Do you know what I mean? Like if someone say, well, I'm chronically disorganized. I'm sorry I forgot (laughs) your... I forgot your birthday for the fifth time, Julie, which is a 21st if a family member's listening. But... You know, but I think that's important Important to know. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, th- I think you can see my larger point, that sometimes something becomes a crutch, right. and it allows us to stay stuck, and it doesn't allow us to move forward. Because there's a term in 
you know, dual diagnosis, which is a lot of times alcohol, drugs, or there's alcohol and eating disorder or something else. So it's very interesting that mm-hmm. in chronic disorganization, because I, I don't think that's well known. Mm-hmm. I mean, if at your level, perhaps, but, you know, I think if we were even, you know, to take a survey of POs, not everyone would know that. No, and it's not, it's not a 100% thing, right. but um, it's interesting because sometimes people, I think they're, I think a lot of people are really intuitive and they'll say, they'll kind of start reaching out and asking, I call them the feeler questions, mm-hmm. like, do you see this with your other clients? And oftentimes, that's a really good opener for me because I'll say, I do see it in other clients. And sometimes um, the people that have gone for, um, you know, an evaluation or um, a, a second opinion, um, they've been diagnosed with ADHD, for example, mm-hmm. or whatever it is that they're, you know. Yeah, so it's, it's helpful. And also, I want to add one more thing. For anybody having trouble, like, deciding where to start or feeling overwhelmed, I have this um, uh, little sheet that is a free download on my website. It's called Declutter in a Jiffy, if you put that in your browser. And it has all of these little things that you can just start decluttering, like wire hangers, plastic stadium cups, you know, sweaters with fuzzballs on them, whatever. <laughs> I have no sweaters with fuzzballs. We've got a couple comments here um homie wants to know where does the disease come from yeah that's actually a great question let's talk about the trauma is it oh this is interesting and also is it getting worse or better in our society okay homie you asked like a bunch of really Mm -hmm. i could have a one hour show on just his (laughs) questions or her questions um okay so where does it come from i don't know but (laughs) there's something called the dsm-5 and it's just out this month and that's the diagnostic statistic manual and it's the fifth version of it and it's causing this really huge uproar in the APA American Psychiatric Association and um, I'm not a psychiatrist but I read a little bit just enough to make me dangerous online right but um, some of the some of the scuttlebutt is because we're over diagnosing like um, everybody now whatever you have there's there's an official term for it and um, one side of the coin says you know, it's just another ploy to get medicated, and now kids aren't allowed to be kids. Every scratch they come up with, there's some big name for it. So that's one side of it. But I have to say from the side that I'm looking at it, which is a professional organizer, having hoarding separated out as its own diagnosis is a really good thing. And the reason is because it doesn't really fall into the other categories. It used to be under the umbrella of OCD, which stands for obsessive compulsive disorder. But as of right now, it's no longer under that umbrella. It's its own diagnosis. And um, it doesn't mimic other things. And we do know that um, OCD shares some genetic characteristics, but it's more of a recessive trait. Hoarding does not seem to fall into that Right now, the statistics and um, research is showing that hoarding actually can be and is often um, inherited and runs in families. Uh, Obviously, those two things mean each, the same thing, don't they? <laughs> right. No, but that's good. But so, see, I always, my kind of understanding was that there was a trauma, just like as eating would cause a trauma or not eating or alcoholism or drug right. abuse you know i think of that show intervention oh well, gosh which yeah. you know mm-hmm. was i can't watch because it traumatizes you to watch the show yeah <laughs> it's so i remember seeing i think i maybe watched one full episode and i was just like this afterwards and so i always assume well you should never assume but that it was a trauma that triggered it you know maybe they had all their kids their toys taken away as a kid and they didn't get a say in that or maybe they lost everything in a fire and and it's and it just gets worse, it yeah. seems to, like, if you isolate and... Right. And there is, there are a lot of links to it being post-trauma. And one of the things that Dr. David Tolan, um, up in the Boston area, shared uh, years ago at a conference, and I've always remembered this, is especially when it's becoming um, more aggressive in midlife, It's probably always been there, but something that happened, meaning something traumatic, has triggered that, and it kind of lies dormant. I shouldn't talk with my hands. I can see them flying around on the screen. (laughs) Um, But um, then it starts to manifest itself. And that kind of makes sense if you think about it, especially, I don't know if homie's dealing with somebody that, you know, maybe in the family. But 
for those first few years of life, you know, that first 18, you don't really have a big budget to go buy a whole bunch of stuff, and you're under somebody else's roof. So what does your mom do when you go to school? Probably chunks things, right? Then you're in college. Again, lack of space, lack of funding. But as you age, we typically have a little more time and space and money to acquire things. So that, that's usually when you see that acquisition start getting more and more aggressive. Now, um, for the follow-up question, uh, is it getting worse or better in society? Do you have a thought on that? I don't think it's getting worse. However, I think now that the door is blown off the hinges, I think a lot more people have a word for that. I know years ago you used to only hear, oh, so-and-so is a pack rat, like an extreme pack rat. Now you don't really see that so much, and we know that pack rats love their stuff, but it's not to the point where there's squalor in the home or they can't function. So I think there's a couple things that do make it a little more easy. We have Goodwill stores. We have um, dollar stores. We have a lot more accessibility to acquiring things. And we also have um, online shopping. So we can shop 24-7 in our PJs and never leave the house. And then here comes, you know, the delivery person with more and more stuff. So I read Candy Spelling had a room in that big old mansion she had that I she think had a was... a giant stuck. warehouse. Right. That yes. was just from her online shopping. Yes. Yes. It's incredible. Online shopping is like a game changer for people. But since you brought up, since uh, Homie brought up society, I'd like to talk for a second about the effects of society of hoarders. I was getting pest control. We had a moth issue in my house the other day, and so the guy came, and we just got started talking about pests, and he started talking about bed bugs, which every time I hear that, I feel like I need to itch. But <laughs> yeah. he said, for the first time in my career, I had to say no to someone. And I said, well, what happened? And he had his smartphone, and he showed me a picture, and he said, he said, I didn't have a choice. They had bed bugs, but there was clutter. You couldn't, you, the bed was there, but it was surrounded by clutter. He said, you have to heat the room to 150 degrees. I said, you, you, we can't do this until you move everything out. Mm -hmm. And he said, they were really upset. But then I thought, I hope they're not my neighbor. If they're moving out the boxes with bed bugs, does that mean I'm going to get bed bugs? So talk a little, bit, a little bit about, because some people think, oh, it's just in the family. It affects whatever. Mm -hmm. It affects all of us. Okay, so this is like one of my favorite topics, the sociology of hoarding. Um, so a couple things. First of all, for any Hoarders fans, I did work with a family with bed bugs. And do you want me to go there for a minute? You do, but I'm going to okay, tie I'll my hands you. because I'm going to start to <laughs> itch. itch yes. okay. All right. So the episode that um, the gentleman I worked with was named Bob. And I want to say it was in season two or three. And if you're on Netflix, you can probably look that up. Um, or it's, I, I might even have it on my website. But anyway, Bob was a father of four children, married to a woman, Betsy. Betsy, Bob is a social worker, was a social worker, right? So ding, 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 mandated reporter. And his wife, Betsy, was a home health care nurse. So they homeschooled their children. Um, they think they went somewhere and bought a piece of um, used furniture, and they think that's how the bed bugs came into the house originally. And bed bugs are fantastic hitchhikers they're the oh, best are they? okay yeah. oh. so you can get them from an airplane seat i mean it's really oh yeah the more you know about them the worse yeah you'll be scratching yeah the guy days. said do you want me to tell you more and i said no <laughs> i said we're done right okay so um bob brings the piece of furniture in before too long his whole home is infested with bed bugs and he's up in pittsfield massachusetts so it's cold he moves his family into a tent in the front yard and they sleep in the tent, and guess what happens? The tent gets infested with bed bugs. So this is when the neighbors, it's getting to be October, and the neighbors start calling. And P.S., Bob lives in a super supportive community. Of, mm -hmm. He has the most fantastic neighbors and church friends. So they're very understanding and compassionate, and you don't always have that with people who with, with a hoarding mm -hmm. disorder. But... Um, Anyway, he moved his family from the tent into his workplace. He snuck in there at night and had the family sleep there while no one was looking. And, of course, you can predict what happened, right? So we had to declutter the entire house. That's what the episode is about. I'm pulling stuff out, and we're trying to let go so that the exterminator could come in and exterminate and get rid of the bed bugs. And we're fortunate. Um, now dogs are trained. They have a super sensitive... Um, snout, they can smell bed bugs. 
we have all kinds of detection devices, but I have to say they are miserable to get rid of thousands of dollars. And, and the guy is right. You heat the place up and you have to remove artwork, candles, crayons, perfumes, lipstick, anything that'll melt. I mean, it's, it's a lot of work. It's very expensive. But then that costs Bob money yes. or hoarders money, right. which, you know, it cost the, the, his office money because they had to decontaminate that. It so cost it affects- me money, Julie. I had to pitch my clothes. I wouldn't. It, here's, here's a behind the scenes story from hoarders. A little embarrassing. Maybe off color. Stop me. <laughs> Stop me if I'm going to embarrass myself. But we wore these disposable Tyvek suits that you go to, you know, the thing and right, paint right. in. And it was freezing in October. I mean, I was like the whole time. And it was Dr. Elizabeth Moore. She was the therapist on site. And we wore thermal underwear because we knew it was going to be cold. We had these Tyvek things. Both of us stopped at a gas station in our rental cars. We put garbage bags over ourselves to drive to the gas station and stripped down into nothing but our coats and zipped them up and drove home like that. And these people were in the lobby of the hotel, and you could just tell they were giving us dirty looks. Like, who are these disgusting women? Like, they, we had bare legs. I, it was all I could do not to yell from the top of my lungs, I'm doing all of you a favor, so don't give me the dirty look, right? <laughs> but we tied our stuff up in a trash bag at the gas station and labeled it bed bugs do not, you know. And right. Yeah, oh, it's, yeah. And everything you get rid of, it has to be disposed of properly because we didn't want other people coming to their curb, picking Being up the trash, right. and then taking bed bugs to their home. So it's, it's a big old... I'm yeah, hopefully not going to have bed bug nightmares no. tonight. We've got a question from Nikki. <laughs> okay. Does this problem equally affect men and women? Yes. Actually, um, right now we think so. Now, here's something interesting, Nikki, or at least it's interesting to me. The people that make up at least my clientele and most other organizers that I talk to all over the country, women make up most of our clientele. Now, that does not mean that women are more likely to be hoard with a hoarding disorder it means that women are most likely to reach out for help. Okay. So it's a very interesting dynamic there. And across the board, organizers agree, and this is very informal survey, survey just us <laughs> gossiping at uh, conferences, but most of our clients are crafters, nurses, and teachers. And we think it's really fascinating that they're all in very nurturing professions, Right. So, again, we don't know if that's just the type of personality because they help people all day. Are they more likely to ask us for help and not be embarrassed Mm -hmm. or stigmatized? Or is there something about that personality who's drawn to that profession that maybe when they're traumatized or have something happen to them, that is the way their, their brain reacts to that? Mike says it means men will not admit to having the problem, which is probably... Well, and here's... Mike is absolutely right. It's not that they won't always admit. Um, There's a lot of embarrassment. Even now, women are much more likely to go to a therapist and get help than a man. So, you know, men seem to be okay living alone and secluding themselves. Women tend to be more out there with stuff. Well, the most famous hoarders were the Collier brothers in New York, right? That's right, Exactly. Um, I'm going to remind everyone, if you have a question for Gerilyn, chat it in or call 919-518-9773 or Skype computers 2K Voice. So tell us about your handy-dandy chart. The three (laughs) hallmarks of chronic disorganization, hoarding, and collecting. Well, it sounds like you've done your homework, so why don't you tell me what you want to know about it? Yeah. (laughs) You just, if it's, I think it's on your site. It is, But it's it's a tool that can help people. Yeah. So if you talk about that a little bit. Um, That chart is kind of borrowed from a lot of stuff I read. So um, I just put together uh, kind of simple columns and rows of what determines, like what makes up a a person with a hoarding disorder, collecting, and somebody who's chronically disorganized. Because there was just always, always people with questions about it. So um, one of the things I pointed out right away is that... um, People who collect will often have you in their house and show off their collections. People who are chronically disorganized, they're not embarrassed to have you in. But a person with a hoarding disorder, a lot of times you will never be invited in. And that's why, Julie, oftentimes their homes are just in total disrepair. They're too embarrassed to even let in repair people. Mm -hmm. I completely understand that. We've got a couple questions for you here on chat. Butch wants to know, 
What did the hoarders tell you they are keeping the stuff for? Is it just someday they think they will need the stuff? Okay, whose question is that? This is Butch. Butch. Okay, Butch. So, um, (laughs) Butch and I could probably have a nice Mm -hmm. long conversation about this, but you're right. So, they think they're going to need it someday. Another reason is they are often extremely sentimental. Another reason is they want to save the planet. So, Julie, that's something probably you could relate to. <laughs> I get that a lot. Is, yeah. is is green organizing, you know, about collecting junk? And I say, no, it's not. Right. But, yeah. They feel responsible. So one of the, um, if you, again, are a fan of the show, if you saw me working with Carrie Lee out in Seattle, Carrie Lee had buckets of old corks and buckets of twist ties from bread and just a lot of things that, you know, I looked at and said, this is taking up a lot of valuable real estate. So why are you saving this? I said, let's just recycle this, donate it, trash it, whatever. She would not let it go unless, and period, she would not right. let it go. But oftentimes their excuse is they want it disposed of properly or they want it to go to a specific person who's going to value it as much as they do. So you've got the eco saver. You have the person who um, is a sentimental saver. You have the I might need the someday saver. And then the other reason is I paid a lot of money for that. I can't let it go. So, you know, even but though. But it goes really beyond that in the sense that oh, yeah. you can. Like, it's an excuse. Right. Right. Absolutely. Now, we've got a question here from Susan T. Will those with hoarding disorders bring their hoarding tendency to the workplace? Or are they able to function normally? Well, that's about a 50-50. So oftentimes they can compartmentalize things. So um, we know that uh, another colleague here in the area, Janice Russell, who also works with people with hoarding disorders, um, we each have a lot of what we call high-functioning people with the disorder. So we have judges, doctors, lawyers, um, physicians, dentists, who their homes are chaotic and their offices maintain order but it's often because someone in that office is holding it together for them ah okay that makes sense Mm -hmm. now what would you say to someone that's a caregiver out there talk about the effect on them if they're like hey what should i do and and also maybe address i believe there's a group for children of hoarders but i think i mean i i remember seeing the episode once and just the kids and being like right just my heart broke for them it is heartbreaking it's um you know you mentioned the community a while ago with the bed bugs thing but also think about the landlords who rent to people and they don't have any idea that the person has a hoarding disorder and then p.s cockroaches vermin lots of problems on shared walls even the backyards. So when you evict these people, they often don't have money and resources and you're the landlord is stuck with the cleanup bill. And it's not just, you know, have the carpet shampooed and paint the walls. It goes a lot deeper than that. So that's one problem. And now I forgot what the heck you asked me, Julie. (laughs) Um, Oh, about how it affects or what would you say to the caregivers oh, yeah. of a hoarder or family, friend or concern? Talk about the kids and your okay. thoughts about that. So a nice group for support if you um, are an adult child of a person with a hoarding disorder is Children of Hoarders website. It's a fantastic resource. They have a forum. Um, the people that run it are very well respected and they are indeed children, adult children of people with hoarding disorder. That's a good website. As far as caretakers, if your partner or your spouse has a hoarding disorder, um, I would encourage you to be in a support group. There's nothing easy. There's no solution. It's a constant battle. It's a lot of money, and it's very stressful on a relationship. I had a client that um, who was really great, and I suspect her husband is well on his way to being a hoarder. I mean, it wasn't like the attic was packed, but it was creeping. Right. So we were just carving out a space, um, you know, but I remember he's a Tar Heel fan. Maybe it's a Tar Heel thing, (laughs) but he had a, um, had like a Tar tar Heel heel Coke or Pepsi. I don't know if you all make like have special, but I was like, you know, and I actually worked with the wife. I'm like, well, let's carve out a space for you. Cause I, uh, cause I was like, that's something like, but this is the direction it's going in. And so you could just see how stressful it was. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And 
um, you know, I keep bringing up the show, but I, it, there's a lot of good examples of what it's like. I did not do this show, but um, David Tolan was the therapist on the show, and he's really phenomenal with people with this disorder, and he's very well respected in the um, hoarding community. He worked with a man named Bill up in the Massachusetts area, and um, Bill and his wife and his daughter lived together, and Bill had um, uh, several townhouses that he bought years ago and never, ever rented them out. So it was thousands and thousands of dollars accumulated over years that could have been earning him money, but instead he was just leaving his stuff in there. And it's the same with storage units. I mean, you know, people will say, I can't afford to have an organizer, or worse, I can't afford a therapist, but... Meanwhile, when we do their finances, they are spending, you know, $20,000 a year in storage. Well, you could afford a therapist with that right, money. Right, right, right. What, um, what would you have? It's kind of hard because I would think that every individual is different. But is there kind of a timeline that, you know, hey, it usually takes a year of therapy and then someone, wish, you yeah. know, or it's kind of too hard to. It's funny because that is my big pressure question for therapists. So um, Michael Tompkins is on the West Coast. He's a San Francisco-based um, therapist, and he also is the author of Digging Out, which is a phenomenal book if you have a hoarding disorder or are trying to cope with somebody. Michael Tompkins employs the Do No Harm, which is actually from uh, addiction Okay, and I'll substance gotcha. abuse. So um, when you're working with people, the premise is that you will not do any harm to them. You're not going to take them out mm-hmm. of their house. You're not going to remove tons of stuff. It's just getting the house good enough to, to keep it safe. So, um, yeah, I, it's just, it's really, um, I, I don't know. Because someone could have a relapse. Exactly. So right. it's kind of um, hard to do that. Well, another thing I want you to talk about, because I don't think people realize they see the show, oh, a whole house in a in a in one hour with commercials, woohoo! Yeah, you know. But you have a team. I mean, you're there for. I think people don't realize. And even if you're not a hoarder, but say if you have that garage that you can't park your car in because it has so much, it takes time. It takes and time. And effort. It so takes talk money. About that. Okay. So um, one of the things that I'm always like pressuring the therapist for is, can you give us a timeline? Can you just tell us 24 visits and they'll be on their way? Or two years of therapy and it looks promising or it'll be a make it or break it, but they can't, they can't do that yet. And um, as far as the show goes, it is one of the criticisms of the show. Oh, you come in and you do everything and it's traumatizing and it's too fast. And But again, it is a crisis situation. Right, These people are going yeah. to lose their children, so we often do the best we can, you know, Mm -hmm. it depends really on what the resources are. So do you have a got junk or a college Mm -hmm. guys, college hunks hauling junk crew? Do you have therapists available? Do you have professional organizers available? Even if you can't do that, get one project manager and maybe people from a church or Mm -hmm. people in the community to come help you. But we know that Family members helping are often not helpful. It just really exacerbates and inflames a bad situation. Oh, yeah. I've learned that the hard way. Yeah. Just to, my mom, I was like, hey, do you want me to organize your pantry? No. Like, right. I was threatening to kill her grandkids. I'm like, all right, <laughs> tell me how you really feel. And we've got an interesting comment here from Hung. I work at a public storage facility, and it's our industry's dirty little secret. I'd estimate a third of our customers fill their units with junk. Real junk, stuff worth nothing. Right. And, you know, I always got to chuckle when I watch Storage Wars because I've been on some, I haven't been on Storage Wars, but I've been to some of those storage units, and it's there's rarely anything of value. So Hung's right. A lot of that stuff that's being stored is not and good. Think about how much money they're spending. How much money, and also you brought up before, you know, the pest control thing. So if you've got tons of cockroaches in your house and you're boxing your stuff up and taking it to a storage unit, it's not gonna... always a good, yeah, not always a good thing for your neighbors <laughs> yeah susan says how many actual hours per day does the crew work on an episode of hoarders oh my gosh okay so we work long hours but so we're there from about eight in the morning until um oh five thirty six at night we take a break for lunch the camera and sound guys have to take a break that stuff weighs a ton but the organizers and the crews usually keep working and they got junk people on that show 
they're you think they're good on the show they're like better in real life they're amazing like those people are angels um so we film at least the episodes that i've been on it's about 36 hours on a short uh filming episode for 18 minutes of tv it's a lot of work that's great. Well, I have to admire you because I worked, uh, volunteered on a hoarding project two years ago in the winter, mm-hmm. and it was here. I thought I was going to go. For me, I'm a very visual person, so the enti- it was a small house. I was overwhelmed. Yeah. I mean, we had five of us, and we didn't work. We took a break, lunch. Maybe it was a seven- or eight-hour day, but I, I just... It's like I just needed to go home and not look at anything. It was for me. It was too, it was overstimulation. The only time we would ever do that is in an absolute crisis situation because um, most people with the hoarding disorder, there's something called decision f- fatigue that sets in. They are not capable of making eight hours worth of decisions. So only when the everything's being risked do you do that. And oftentimes we ask permission in advance. And um, can we throw away anything that has fecal matter? Can we throw away junk mail? Can we, you know, so we get a pre-approved list and that way we kind of reduce the number of decisions being made. Hung uh, says we have customers spending 20 to 30,000 per year to store. And again, that's your your thing about hiring a therapist. Mm -hmm. Now, someone wants to know if our producer is a hoarder, but Gerilyn does not. (laughs) Uh, disclose. She has a confidentiality agreement with all her with all her clients, so we're not going to answer that. But thank you. And remember, I'm not qualified to diagnose. She's it not qualified be a... to diagnose. <laughs> what would you say are the biggest obstacles for hoarders or collectors or someone with chronic disorganization? If you could say, you know what, these seem to be common things that are challenging for people to get over so um the number one thing that at least i see with my clients and i know other organizers so i don't know what the therapy spin would be but for me it's something i call ants a-n-t-s automatic negative thoughts and so that would mean julie let me help you declutter your computer let me no i don't want to do that because you might um i might need something okay great let's go to the coffee table and do that no i don't want my coffee table done because so in other words anything that's suggested they have a reason why it's not going to work automatic negative thoughts that's my number one obstacle with people that's really interesting now but would you say then the negative thought is a result of trauma Again, or do you think I'm that's probably, or personality. Yeah. It's kind of hard. I think it goes along with this disorder. That's what I think. Because I, I work with a lot of other people with other mental health disorders and challenges, and um, it seems to be more prevalent with somebody with a hoarding disorder. Sometimes you run into that with people with depression, but oftentimes with depression, they will give you mm-hmm. the leeway and say, I just can't deal with it. I'm exhausted. If you want to, if you make the decision for me. So there's a big difference there. Um, have you could, can you talk about, um, do you know any with clients that you've worked with some specific trauma that caused hoarding? Like for instance, abuse, we talked earlier about having, uh, you know, toys taken away, but were there things that were a little, I don't want to say more serious, but just a little more, you know, again, like abuse or anything like that. Have you noticed that? Yeah. Um, so a really interesting one from TV that, um, they were pretty sure and she's actually completely changed her life around and i'm still in contact with her a lot so if you can get a hold of the episode with gail in it and dr scott hannon from boston is the doc and um she gave us a run for our money gail was ornery and obstinate and wonderful in every quirky way that you want a client to be so and of course that makes fun tv right so (laughs) Gail collected wooden toilet seats and old lunch pails, and she just had this wild collection of stuff. But she was, um, in the beginning, she was kind of coming across like a curmudgeon, but there was something about her that, um, I don't know, she, she just really, it's almost like I could sense she was ready, she's on that breaking point. And I could tell how she was answering Dr. Hannon all the time that um, she was really trying. She was really Mm -hmm. making an effort. And, of course, they edit out some of the, you know, parts where she's making an effort. But that's that's just what you have to put up with. But anyway, um, the first night of filming, Gail lived in a big house, a historical house in Seattle. 
and um, no heat, and only one room had electricity. Gail was a woman in her late 60s and needed surgery, and that was the crisis here. The um, medical folks would not let her go back into her own home because it was in such bad condition and freezing. So we started one day decluttering, and she, like I say, gave us just a bad time all day long. But that evening, the organizers and I hung around with her, and I we were starving. I mean, we just worked so hard all day, and we decided to order a pizza. She, We asked her if she would mind if we stayed later after all the camera crews left, and we continued working because we knew we could make progress on this house, and there was a lot of progress. And I didn't want her to come home to this freezing cold house. It really bothered me. <laughs> She said yes, and we ordered a pizza, and we said, would you like to join us? And she came, and remember, this is a no-heat house, so it's like you're doing this with your pizza. And the minute you open the box, it's like the heat is all gone, but when you're hungry, you're desperate, you'll eat anything. Well, she started crying while we were eating, and I remember thinking, oh, no, maybe we've you know crossed the line. Maybe this is so inappropriate. Maybe every boundary has been busted here, but what she was crying is she said, I haven't had anyone in my house Mm -hmm. in 25 years. I know I'm going to get emotional just saying this. And she said, it just feels so good to share a meal with people. And And she said, and this was very grandmotherly, she said, I really forgot how fun it is to be with girls and have girl talk Mm -hmm. and all that. And I'm thinking, wow, you forget those little moments. And we finished the pizza and we told her to go up to bed because it was really dark and cold. And that was the only place she had an electric blanket and a hot water bottle and all that other stuff. So we knew she had to be freezing. We continued to work a few hours, came back the next day. And it was like the next day she started letting go of more and more and more. By the time we left, she still had a ton of work to do, but for two years, she's continued to make progress. Her house is completely done now. She just sent me pictures at Christmas. Oh, it was phenomenal. Yeah. That's really wonderful. We've got a couple questions on. Susan wants to know, have, Gerilyn, have you ever experienced trash alance and had stuff fall on you? trash alance happens to be my word. Thank you. I know oh, that. You that Susan's an organizer. And, um, yeah, I make up all kinds of little vocabulary words on the jo- job. I have... Um, Hordnasium, that's where you, uh, it, it's like a gymnasium full of obstacles, but you trip and fall all over stuff in your room. I have, I wear corduroys on a job. That's washable corduroys. <laughs> yeah. Susan's being a wise guy. Thanks for listening, Susan. That's fun. Yeah. I used trash a on my Facebook page the other day and Susan caught it. I like that. I have never, um, I've never experienced trash a I might be able to get a little trash a going if I pulled something off the shelf up here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen, is my guess. Now, Anne wants to know, actually, earlier in the show, we talked about the definition of a hoarder, and uh, Gerilyn talked about isolation and not being able to let go of stuff. Um, she wants to know, how would you know if someone is a hoarder or keeps things they do use in their work and do need occasionally or buy stuff that needs fixing but doesn't have time to fix it? Now, I would love to know, because my fiancé is the Imelda Marcos of tools. Now, however... <laughs> He, he can, I mean, he can do just about everything. And so I understand if it's a little bit, like he had, like, pulled out a knife the other day and had the little kit. So I was like, okay. But that's a good question. So if they use things occasionally, what would you say to that? I mean, because that's his thing. I'm going to say it's not hoarding. Right. Because it has to be causing a, an extreme amount of uh, pain, difficulty. It's chronic. It's been going on a while. And it's you're out of space. So if this person, anybody who's still sleeping in their bed or cooking right. in their kitchen or using their bathroom and can navigate down around their tool bench, that's that's just not somebody with a hoarding disorder. That's just somebody who likes to have a lot of stuff. <laughs> right, right. And well, you know what? He fixes everything in the house. So yeah. I'm, Send I'm him to cool my house. with them. That's great. You know, yeah. He is, you know, when on our first month, he's like, do you want me to redo your floor? I'm dating him like, redo my floor. Come on over. Is that when you said I'm going to marry this guy? No, it's actually at Christmas time, but close, but close. Okay. Um, what do you think about um, something like extreme couponing? I, to me, I think that is a form, like, again, I couldn't. It's so organized, though. Wow. But I get, I get what you're saying. Who needs 90 tubes of toothpaste, right? And I mean, yeah, that just, I, I can't watch stuff like that. That just really, like, again, I have maybe a 10-minute thing, and then I'm like, I'm gone. You can't watch, and I can't stop watching, so I'm the opposite. But, um Probably, no, probably not hoarding because they can let go of things. It's not ruining the rest of their lives. There aren't relationships, but 
there's a lot. That's a whole different, that's a show for somebody else, not me. But it's a fascinating, that whole, yeah. It's almost like a gambling high. Like they get the high, well, you know, being able to pay $1 for $1,000 worth of stuff right. or whatever Well, guess it is. what? You just said something that um, nobody else who's ever done this interview has um, said. And they think that people with a hoarding disorder, as I said, they used to think it was OCD, but now... But they know that the same part of your brain, and it's not a, it's not a gambling disorder, okay, but um, the urge to go get something, like say the UPS person pulls up that little wee, it's here, is the same part of your brain as when you, like, uh-huh. win something gambling or, you know, scratch mm-hmm. off a lottery ticket and wee, I won 50 cents or whatever it is. So, yeah, there's something about that. That's really interesting. Yeah, yeah but I, I, you, I can understand that. Mm-hmm. Now, I want to remind everyone, if you have a question for Gerilyn, chat it. She's happy to answer it or call 919-518-9773 or Skype at Computers 2K Voice. And you mentioned earlier, if someone has a loved one that, that they believe is a hoarder, a support group would probably be the first step for them to take. Yes, and there are clutter support groups. There's squalor support groups. There's children of hoarders. There's Messies Anonymous. Those are just a few of the online um, Now, talk a little bit about, I don't work with hoarders, and I make that very clear, but if someone's out there like, okay, you know what, I'm going to spend the money to hire someone that can help me, how do they know to find the right professional organizer? Okay, so one of the things to do is go to your browser and type in professional organizer hoarding expert or chronic disorganization expert. I would suggest going to the website um, challengingdisorganization.org. And then in the search tool, you will be able to put in your zip code and then look for a specific type of organizer and at least look for somebody credentialed who has hoarding experience. And when you're interviewing that person, I would ask, how many people have you worked with? What therapist do you collaborate with? That is critical to me. And, you know, um, have some measures in place because There's a lot of people out there right now who think that they are doing the right thing, but you can do more harm than good, so you you don't want that, especially with an organizer. You don't want them ruining every bit of trust that's built in. Oh, right, absolutely. No, I think that's kind of back to the therapist or the organizer time I said do no harm. Right. As being... Dr. Tompkins. um, As being the first thing. Talk a little bit about your level five... Uh, master uh, yeah. chronic disorder. What's going on with that, and what exactly does that mean? And because that's, I mean, pretty prestigious to be one of two dozen people in the world. Thank you. Yeah, um, there's more people in training, which is good, and um, it's through the challengingdisorganization.org website. It's basically um, there's different levels. So the first level you can achieve a certificate, and it's usually in chronic disorganization, and then you start slowly working up. The next, um, there's a few more certificates, and then the third level up is the CPOCD. That stands for um, Chronic Certified Professional Organizer Specializing Mm -hmm. in Chronic Disorganization. Level four is where they flip the tables, and you are um, coaching someone else. So the third level is someone is coaching you for about 18 months, and then level four is you coach, and then level five is another continuation of combination coaching, reading, writing papers. So it's a pretty long involved. You better be serious when you start. Yeah, that it's, you want to it's do a that. serious investment of cash and time and a lot of work. A lot of work. But <laughs> yeah. you know what? You love what you do. I so love what I do, and I love my clients. And yeah. that's what, and I just have to say I have a friend that works for Gerilyn. She's like, thank you for sending Gerilyn my way. I love thanks. her. Yeah, thanks. I think she's wonderful. Now, I ask all Guess two questions are really important to me. Uh-oh. What would you say to someone who's struggling right now? You know, maybe they've got clutter, maybe they're a hoarder, but maybe they're going through a divorce or just at a really challenging time in their life. What would you say to them? Okay, um, are they contacting me for organizing help or help in general? You can talk it to, to you know what you'd suggest from an organizing perspective or just a, a general advice you'd say if you had a friend who was struggling. What would you say to? I like to ask a lot of questions, and sometimes I find that by asking questions, these people actually have a lot more intuition and answers within them. So I love to start with, let's talk about how well you're practicing self-care right now. And usually it starts off pretty benign, nothing invasive, 
but if they're open-minded and willing to share it with me, I usually like to start digging deeper. You know, how much do you sleep? Um, are you happy in most of your relationships? Are you socializing? What do you do for fun? How, what's your diet like? Mm-hmm. Um, and then I like to find out again if they're open-minded and willing to try and experience different things. Sometimes people just get in a rut and need to change things around. And of course, if if it is a mental health disorder, I always suggest they go get a, an evaluation. Okay, now I did it a little late in this uh, in this interview, but I'm all about getting off the couch. So, what one step Doing. can people take <laughs> right after the show, before they go to bed, or tomorrow morning to reawaken their brilliance? I think, um, okay, so here's a really quirky, weird thing that I like to do every once in a while. Change hands with whatever you do. So if you're right-handed, try brushing your teeth with your left hand. Uh, Open your car door. Open your refrigerator. Change hands. It changes everything. And when you're changing hands, link another good habit to it. So if you just try for one week, five business days, turning things upside down, and if you usually have a cup of coffee before you unload the dishwasher, link it to something else. I'm going to unload the dishwasher and reward myself with a cup of coffee. After I reward myself with that, I will do something else. So it's a good thing, bad thing, good thing, bad thing. Oh, I like that. Yeah. That's that's very unique. I've never, I'm just trying to think about brushing my teeth. And I'll, I'll throw hand. one in because I know you're varsity squad, okay? So as you're brushing your teeth, I have one of those timers on my toothbrush. I'm now doing leg squats. Well, for two minutes. Ooh, so I'm thinking that's really good. It's not going to change much, but it's a good, you know, it's a good. I have a wedding dress that I need to All get right, Julie. into. Less than four months. You can do jumping jacks while you're brushing or something I cardiovascular. Like that. Although the yeah. squat thing's really good. Yeah, because right, your legs are your biggest muscles, right? Get those moving <laughs> now. Um, Susan says, I just want to thank you to you veteran organizers who've opened the doors for us newbies. Oh, mwah, Susan. Is so, yes, isn't she great? Yeah. Seriously, if you're considering being a professional organizer, this is your best resource. Now, tell us your website, where we can find out more information about you, if you have any classes, anything that's coming up that you want to tell people about. Okay. I teach monthly classes for anybody who wants to be a professional organizer. You can find more information on about those at napo.net that stands for national association of professional organizers.net that's a mouthful and if that wasn't enough um, my website is metropolitanorganizing.com and i'm located in cary north carolina and she's got wonderful things i um, am a firm believer that everyone should get over their fear of public speaking and i've been speaking a couple years and got gerilyn's uh public speaking packet and it makes life a lot Thank you. easier. It's super organized. I was like, oh, <laughs> not that I should have been surprised about that, but that is very important. And that's a great tool, Thank whether you. you're going to be a professional organizer or in business, it's something important to have. Now, Gerilyn has been kind enough to be a part of my workshop that's coming up. And I want to talk to you about it. Procrastination is about fear. Or in, you know, or what are you afraid of? Do you know what you're afraid of? Do you want to find out what you're afraid of? I've started this online course. You can get, we're going to have three nationally known experts. In addition to Gerilyn, we're going to talk about the body, mind, spirit perspective of why you're procrastinating. You get to watch it just like you're watching us now. It's not radio, so it's like you're actually in class sitting from the comfort of your home. You can also watch on your cell phone. You get to interact. If you have a question for Gerilyn, you get to ask it or any of other panelists. And you get to review the class as much as you want for up to a week. And you also get three different perspectives on the problem. So if you go to the events page here, it's going to take you to Eventbrite to register. It's next Tuesday, 7 o'clock, on Stopping Procrastination, Overcoming Procrastination. We would love to see you there. And there's a code there so you can save $5. But it's going to be a really amazing class, and we hope you can join us. And I want to also thank... Emily Parks of Organizing for Success, who is our sponsor. Again, if you look down below in the chat box, see her smiling face, and you can click, and that'll take you right to her website, organizedforsuccess.biz, and you can learn more about what she has to offer and her upcoming classes. All right, everyone. We'll see you next week. Bye now. Bye-bye. tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. Our weekly lineup of call-in programs includes Computers 2K Now with Amnon Nissan, Sundays 9 a.m. till noon. K-12 
Carrie's Psychic Cafe with Carrie Silkowski, Sundays 8 till 9 p.m. Health Inn with Debbie Brook, Mondays 11 a.m. till noon. Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon, Mondays 8 till 9 p.m. Reawaken Your Brilliance with Julie Seibert, Wednesdays 9 till 10 p.m. And if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it at www.nissancommunications.com. Sponsored by thatvidblasterguy.com, carolinaapparel.com, and deltaforce.net.